Good morning. It's Sunday. It's also Mother's Day, so I hope that all the dads out there were prepared for this. Happy Mother's Day. Now, welcome to another streaming service here at First Baptist Church St. Paul. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Now, we do have some announcements this week, and I'm afraid they're not all great. So first, the bad news. Uh, so we've begun discussions on how best to, to go about opening up the church for Sunday services as the sanctions are starting to lift on the social mandates. So for now, we are feeling led to continue doing the live stream only on Sunday mornings as far as services go. Now, I will say that all of us are ready to be back together. We all want to start meeting together as a family of believers again. Um, and while we all agree on that, we also agree that we don't want to put anyone in danger. And right now, just lo looking at all the uh, trend analysis that we're looking at and other implementation plans, we, we really don't want to put any member of the church at risk. So we're going to continue with the live stream for now. But we will be meeting again in, on the 1st of June so we can discuss a phased plan at opening the church building back up. And I say church building because we are the church. We, we're not confined to the, the walls of the church there. And then as a result of all this as well, with everything going on, um, we've also made the decision that we're going to just cancel VBS, Vacation Bible School, this year. And I, I'm very sorry for that. Um, Dania and I, we love Vacation Bible School. It's one of our favorite things. And so I, I'm sorry that we're, we're going to have to cancel it this year. But just with everything going on, um, we, we don't have enough to make it happen this go around. Okay, and so now for the good news, okay? The, gr the good news, the great news, in fact, is that we exceeded our Annie Armstrong offering. So our initial goal was for $1,000, but this year we received 1135 So praise God, and thank you all so much for your faithful giving to such an important ministry. And so those are our announcements, and now please join us as we sing, Oh, How I Love Jesus, and then immediately following that, it's going to be time for Dania's Kids Clip. All right, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Welcome back. 
Today our story comes from the book of John. John 14, verse 6. In this scripture, Jesus tells us the way to the Father. Speaking of the way, I brought some direction signs with me. When I show you the arrow, I'd like you to look the way it points. Ready? Very good. Now, as I share about the Bible lesson, see if you can follow the instructions and look the right way when you see a sign. Stop and imagine how Jesus' disciples felt in our Bible's lesson. Jesus knew the day of his crucifixion was coming and that he would soon refer, return to the Father in heaven. He was trying to prepare his disciples for the time that he would no longer be with them. Don't worry, Jesus said. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will be with me. You know the way where I'm going. No, we don't, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going. So how will we know the way? Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Philip, another disciple, spoke up, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus replied, I have been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Jesus wanted his disciples to know that he and the Father were one. And if they put their trust in God and in him, they would one day join him in heaven. Sometimes life can be very confusing. We don't know which way to turn or what path to take. And sometimes we even feel like we hit a dead end. When that happens, we need to remember that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, and follow his teachings, we will find the path to our goal, eternal life in heaven with him. We can only come to God through Jesus. Our scripture today is John 14, 1 through 6. And I'd like to show you in sign language how we say this. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Can you do it with me? Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Very good. Now in a prayer position, we're going to speak to our Lord. Dear God, thank you so much for giving us Jesus so that we know the way to you. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. Now we're going to sing together, Standing on the Promises. See you next time. Praises ring, glory in the highest I will.
shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. We come now to our time of prayer. If you have your prayer request list, please pull them out now. If for some reason you're not receiving the prayer request list, please let us know and we'll get you added to the email distribution list. If you have any new prayer requests, please feel free to get on the church's website and fill out the prayer request form or send them to us and we'll make sure that they get added to the list. And now let's please go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are holy, you are almighty, you are wonderful, you are glorious in all the earth. You are the God, you are the King of kings, you are the Lord of hosts, and you are absolutely wonderful. We love you, Lord, so very, very much. I pray, Father, that you will look over all those that are sick right now. I pray that you will... Look over those that have tested positive for COVID-19 and that you put your hand of healing on them. I pray that you look over those of us that suffer from other diseases, cancer and emphysema and other unknown diseases uh, you know, or, or healing from surgeries. I, I pray, Lord, that you will put your hand of healing on everyone that needs it and bring them back to 
100% health, Lord, was we know, Father, that you are the healer. We know that you can perform that healing in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you put your hand of comfort on those that have lost people during this time, those people that are struggling. I pray that you take care of them. I pray that you you give them comfort, give them peace as they, they navigate these trying times of loss and grief. I pray, Lord, that you will put your hedge of protection around our police officers, our firemen, our linemen. I pray you put your hedge of protection around the medical personnel, um, the doctors, the nurses, the janitorial staff, all those people there. I pray that you will look over them and, and keep them from getting sick as they, they seek to eradicate this disease here. I pray, Lord, for the town of St. Paul. I pray, Father, for, the, for Castlewood as well. I pray that, that those towns will make it through this time of uncertainty and that when we get through all of this, that both of them will thrive. I pray that you look over the, the citizens of both of these towns. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you keep them, Lord, and, and be with them during this trying time. We know, Lord, that you ultimately know what's going to happen. You ultimately have this all figured out. And I pray, Lord, that you put your hand of peace on each and every one of us as we go through and navigate these, these difficult times. Thank you, Lord, for the fellowship that we're able to have here. Thank you for giving us the abilities to, to worship together, even from far away. And thank you, Father, for all of the love and blessings and all of your mercies that are visited on us every day. And we thank you most of all for the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Father, and we pray these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. So now we will be singing Love Lifted Me. So please, everyone, stand up and let's sing Love Lifted Me. That's about the only uh, part of the song that I've actually got memorized.
One day a little girl is sitting and watching her mother do the dishes at the kitchen sink. She suddenly notices that her mother has several strands of white hair sticking out in contrast to her dark brunette hair. And she looks at her mom and inquisitively asks, why are some of your hairs white, mom? Her mother replied, well, every time that you do something wrong and make me cry or unhappy, one of my hairs turns white. The little girl thought about this revelation for a while, and then she asked, Mommy, how come all of Grandma's hairs are white? It is Mother's Day today. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. Now, instead of doing the fun fact about me part of the service, I'm going to give you a fun fact about Dania. She was born in California, close to Los Angeles, but her parents moved her to Northern Virginia when she was about four years old, so she spent most of her formative years there. You would think that as a military spouse, she would have moved to more states, but sadly, she has moved around a lot, but just in the state of Virginia. The biggest move I've ever taken her on was the one to Wisconsin, where there was a lot of cheese and cornfields. So today we are going to continue with our study in John. Last week we looked at the various names that people used for Christ and the calling of his disciples. This week we will look at the first miracle. Again, I want to encourage anyone that has questions or comments to contact me. You can get a hold of me on the church website, through email, or through Facebook. Now if you have your Bibles, please turn them to John chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 1 through 12. On the third day, a wedding took place in Cana of Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding as well. When the wine ran out, Jesus' mother told him, They don't have any wine. What does that have to do with you and me, woman? Jesus asked. My hour has not yet come. Do whatever he tells you, his mother told the servants. Now six stone water jars had been set there for Jewish purification. Each contained 20 or 30 gallons. Fill the jars with water, Jesus told them. So they filled them to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they did. When the head waiter tasted the water, after it had become wine, he did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. He called the groom and told him, Everyone sets out the fine wine first, then after people are drunk, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum together with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they stayed there only a few days. This is the first recorded miracle of Jesus in the Gospels, the miracle of turning water into wine. Now, I'm going to tread lightly with this subject because we are Baptists and it can be a touchy topic because we're not big fans of alcohol consumption. And unfortunately, this miracle leads some to believe that getting drunk is okay. In fact, I've had sailors look at me before and say that it was okay to go out drinking because, after all, Jesus turned water into wine, didn't he? Now, in the history of the church, there are two groups that wanted to deny that Jesus made any wine. And not surprisingly, these groups, they are on the opposite ends of the theological spectrum. The first group, they were very dogmatic when it came to alcohol, and they contended that Jesus merely gave the guests water. Their idea is, is that water is the best wine. And while that is true, water is the best wine, the fact is, is that wine was present there at the wedding feast. Now the other group, they denied any miracles whatsoever, and they contend that when Jesus had them pour the water into the jars, the dregs from the wine were on the bottom, and so as a result, there was going to still be a little taste of wine, so when they served it to the guests, the guests just thought it was the good wine because they were too intoxicated to tell. Uh, but both of these can be proven false. So in the case of the first group, the servants, they take the wine to the head waiter, and he recognizes it as wine. And so he would have been sober, and he would have realized that it was just water. Now, the dregs thesis is proven all, false also because the water was in the waters for 
purification rites. So we talked about purification rites earlier with the washing of the hands and everything else. So with this wedding feast, there were other cleansing rites that had to be performed by the wedding guests. And that's what these stone jars were for, were for ritual purification. So there would have only been water in there. There would not have been any wine. So there would have been no dregs whatsoever. So and then in addition to that, the head waiter still recognizes what the waiters bring him as wine. And since he was overall in charge of the wedding feast, he would have been sober and he would have thought, okay, well, this water is clearly inferior, but he talks about it being superior. Now, I bring this up because a, clearly a miracle occurred here. And in trying to disprove the miracle based on a personal preference, one way or the other negates what the scripture says. And it, 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 try, it ten, tends to, it tries to negate Christ's work here. Now, weddings in Jesus' time, they lasted for a week. And the fact that they ran out of wine was a very serious dilemma. For one, there was the social stigma and embarrassment for the groom, because this meant he had failed to adequately, adequately plan for his guests. And if that wasn't enough, there could have also been a fine imposed on the family for such a faux pas, because the Jewish laws concerning hospitality, hospitality back then, they were very strict and this was a serious error on their part. So I thought that it was rather fitting that this scripture fell on Mother's Day, since Mary is a prominent character in this account. Jesus, his disciples, and Mary, they're all invited to this wedding. Now, odds are that his disciples had not been invited in advance, so they were just last-minute additions on the guest list. Now, the text indicates that Mary must have been close with the family of the two getting married because she knows what has happened. And so Jesus' mother lets him know that they don't have any more wine. They've run out. And after she notifies him, Christ responds in a way that seems rather blunt. Now, the Holman Christian translation that I read says, what does this have to do with me and you, woman? Whereas the NIV will translate it, woman, why do you involve me? Now, in today's context, that sounds pretty disrespectful. Now, I am positive that if I ever began a conversation with, with Dania by saying, woman, it would not be greeted well. However, in this time, the term woman was a term of respect and would be similar to him calling her ma'am or by another pleasantry. And as far as the statement, what does that have to do with you and me? The Greek is a very difficult construct. And if we translate it word for word, it actually translates what is this to you, to me? So the translators, they, they had to do their best at making sense of the sentence in English. But however it's translated, it seems that Christ was trying to convey in a respectful manner that she has no business directing him on what to do in his earthly ministry and that he was taking direction from the Father in heaven. Now, this is not the first time he has made this distinction. In Luke 2, Verse 49, we're told that Mary and Joseph are on their way back home from a journey. And Mary and Joseph, they realize that Jesus is not with their traveling party. And so they find him three days later in the synagogue. And when they ask why he had treated his parents this way, Jesus responds to them, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? So even in his adolescence, Christ pointed to who his father is, and he was going to do the, the fa God the Father's will, not the will of man. Now, the separation from where he gets his orders from is important. And this is because there are some sects within Christendom, within Christianity, that elevate Mary to more of a deified status because they believe that she drove Christ into his ministry by telling him to make wine for the wedding. But that's not the case, and the scripture shows that that is, that is false. Mary did not direct Jesus on what to do. She merely brought a problem to his attention. Now, it's unclear, because he says that his hour has not yet come, but he goes ahead and he solves the problem anyway. And so when Mary says, do whatever he tells you, that's a fantastic command that we should all really strive to adhere to. Do what Jesus tells you. And so without skipping a beat, these servants, they do just that. 
they filled the jars all the way to the brim, just as Jesus had told them to. Now, it's curious why Christ did not just fill the jars up himself. But he had the power to, but instead he has the servants do it. Now, it would have taken a bit of elbow grease to get them filled up by a man because they held about 20 to 30 gallons. So this means they would have had to bring smaller containers of water to fill them up. Now, believe it or not, 20 to 30 gallons is incredibly heavy. Now, for a long time there, I used to have several fish tanks and I had a 20 gallon tank. And if that was filled with water all the way, there was no way I was going to be able to move it by myself. It would take several people just to get it from one end of the house to the other. So I, I think that the reason he has the servants do this is to prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that a miracle had in fact occurred. Because notice that Jesus doesn't do anything to show that he is performing a work. He's not grandstanding saying, okay, well, now look at this. I'm going to turn this water into wine. You know, he's not grandstanding. But at the same time, had he filled the water jars up by himself through a miracle, then the folks at the wedding, they could have just assumed that there was wine in them all along. So the servants at a minimum know that there is nothing in there but water. And instead, he simply tells them to draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And there's no doubt expressed by any of them. They just go ahead and they do it. The Lord had told them, and they ask no questions. And it's quite the order. Draw some out and take it to the head waiter. Now, the Greek word used for head waiter is architiklinos, which literally means master of the banquet. So the master of the banquet had the responsibilities during the wedding of making sure that everything went smoothly. He ensured that the food and the beverages were prepared properly. And in fact, he would taste them before they were portioned out and served to the guests and attendants. But in addition to this, he also had the duties of master of ceremonies. So these servants, they're, they've not even tested this wine themselves, but they go ahead and they take it to the head honcho before they serve it. I mean, it, it seems simple enough, but really there was no questioning attitude on, well, you know, is this wine? They don't taste it themselves. And they don't look at Jesus and say, well, well can, can you just verify that we're doing what's right here? Um, can, can you verify that there, there's wine in those jars now? There's none of that. They just take it directly to the waiter. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been plenty of times in my life where I have questioned directions. And I can also assure you that I have been questioned after giving orders more often than not. Now, this is true, especially when Dania or I give the kids direction. Now, we will consistently get some form of questioning or talking back whenever any, any kind of direction is given. And for the longest time there, my kids, believe it or not, would accuse me of only ever yelling at them. Um, then I would have to remind them that I would tell them to do something once in a nice voice and then a second time in a nice voice. And then the third time I would just assume they did not hear me. So I had to be loud enough that I knew that they heard me. In addition to this, uh, when we give the directions, we also sometimes have to use the countdown method. And this works because the kids assume that, OK, well, mom and dad mean business, so I better do what what I'm told to now. That method works for the most part, but it really depends on the circumstance. So if they're not getting fast, getting up fast enough to go clean up their bedrooms, well, then sure, it works. But, you know, if they're getting ready to walk into a busy street, it's not going to work very well. So generally, it's better for us just to obey the first time we're told. So Reagan and I, we belong to Trail Life USA. And every year our troop does what is known as medieval combat camp. And it's about what it sounds like. There's a bunch of kids with homemade, but very safe and very inspected weapons that are made of cardboard, styrofoam, and pool noodles. And we would meet on a campground and we would compete with other troops in the area. Now, last year at the campsite, I noticed a tree that was being overtaken by poison oak. And this poison oak was huge. It looked like a tree. It had a lot of branches that were sticking out just far enough that if a kid were to walk by it and he was tall enough that he was going to get a face full of poison ivy or poison oak. Now, it wasn't really in part of a camp that was traveled a lot by foot. It was closer to where the, the parking lot for the dads was. And um, we would use that kind of as a as a shortcut to get to the campsite. 
and it was easy enough to, for us to avoid when it was light out because we could see it. But later that night, I had to run out and pick something up from my tent, and I saw one of our teens was walking in a beeline directly toward that tree in the poison oak, and I just yelled, stop! And to my amazement, he didn't take another step. He stopped just inches before hitting the tree. I told him to take a step back and to turn around. And when he did, I said, dude, I am so glad you listened to me. You were headed right into this. And I took my flashlight and I shone it up there at the three shiny leaves that he was so close to. Now, had this young man waited for me to count down so that he knew I meant business, he would have surely walked into that spot in that fun time of playing with pool noodles and hanging out with his friends would have been replaced with a call to his mom, a definite end to his camp, and probably a visit to the doctor. So see, this, this young man, he listened to an authority figure in his life, and he was spared from a small disaster. Likewise, the servers, they, they recognized that Jesus, he had some authority, but they did not realize the magnitude of it. Because there's nothing in this text that indicates they know that Christ is the Messiah. They're merely doing what Mary told them to, and that's following Jesus' directions. And notice that we're not told in the scriptures that the ser servants came to have a belief as Jesus and Messiah based on the miracle. We're only told in verse 11 that Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee. He revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Now, this does not indicate that the disciples had a lack of faith prior to his first miracle. Instead, this event solidified and stabilized their faith. So given that the servants were not believers of Christ as the Messiah, but were willing to follow his guidance, it begs the question, how much more should we be quick to obey our Savior? I mean, we recognize Jesus as the Lord of the universe. So why not seek his guidance regularly and follow his path? And when we feel the Lord moving us in one direction, why would we falter and go another way? As his followers, we should strive to make sure that we're constantly following his directions. Now, I think it's interesting that Christ's first miracle was turning water into wine. Now, going all the way back to Exodus 7, 20 through 21, we see that the Lord had turned water into another substance. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord had commanded. He raised his staff in the presence of Pharaoh and his officials and struck the water of the Nile, and all the water was changed into blood. The fish in the Nile died, and the river smelled so bad that the Egyptians could not drink its water. Blood was everywhere in Egypt. Now, I will admit to you that when I was going through the material, I was reading up on a commentator that made... <laughs> brought it to my attention again, he reminded me that the first sign Moses gave Pharaoh was turning water to blood. However, having recently seen the Ten Commandments movie and remembering from reading through Exodus, I thought for sure that the first sign Moses gave was turning the staff into a snake. So you know what I did? I went back to the source material in Exodus. And sure enough, I was reminded that it was Aaron that made his staff into a snake not Moses. So if ever in doubt what the Lord is telling you to do or something doesn't sound right coming from a teacher, it's not jiving, you know, always go back to the source material and measure it against God's holy word. Because after all, that's one of the reasons that we have the Bible. It's so that we can draw instruction from us, from it, excuse me. Anyway, in terms of the plagues that were being wrought out on Egypt, the turning of the water to blood was bad. But there were more terrible things in their future. Because of the hardness of heart, they'll see a plague of frogs, gnats, flies, a plague on the livestock, boils, hail, locusts, and darkness. And when those plagues are over, the final plague to hit the Egyptians was the death of the firstborn. The plagues visited upon the Egyptians got worse and worse as they went on. And they were meant to punish the hard-hearted Pharaoh and his people. But meanwhile, during that same time, the blessings that the Lord kept giving the Israelites got better. They're delivered from Egypt, and eventually they make it to the promised land. And now here we are in John. Jesus, the God of the universe, is here amongst his people, and 
he performs his first miracle by turning water into wine. And he's going to go on from here, and he's going to, going to perform many other miracles. And each one is going to be better than the last. And then the very last miracle he, he performs on this earth is going to be his best, because that's when he resurrects three days after dying on the cross, in order that we who believe on him will have everlasting life. His best miracle was his last miracle during his earthly ministry. So God saves the best for last. Now, after drinking the wine that Jesus had made from water in verse 9, the head waiter calls to the groom, everyone sets out the fine wine first, then after the people are drunk freely, the inferior. But you have kept the fine wine until now. Now, it would make sense to put the cheap stuff out after everyone was drunk and didn't care. They would have been desensitized to it at that point. Now, similarly, the same thing can be said of sin. Because when it comes to sin, the world is going to throw its best pictures of it at us. And it's going to do everything it can to entice us into falling into its deadly trap. And then after we're ensnared by these alluring pleasures and the brief happiness that sin offers, it's going to run out. But God's blessings, they never run out. The joy that Christ gives us never goes away. It never runs out. And, and further, we know that he's saving his best blessing for us last because we will receive that blessing when we're united with God the Father in heaven when we leave this earth. And this is because God gave his only begotten son so that everyone who believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life. God loves us. God loves you. God loves me. And he wants to have fellowship with you and me. But unfortunately, because of sin, the, the sin that seems so great, and really the world doesn't even recognize as sin anymore, because of that sin, that fellowship with him is broken. And plenty of folks these days, they believe that they're going to get in heaven because they do good works. But unfortunately, that's not the case because our most righteous works that we perform here on earth, they're seen as filthy rags before the Lord. So the only thing that is going to save us is our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and to trust in him to take our sins away. So Jesus, he gathers his disciples and then he goes to a wedding with them. And when they run out of wine, it's brought to his attention and he solves the problem. Now, the servants of the wedding, they obeyed the words without doubting, and he just, when he told them what to do, much like we should, and the wine that he produced was superior was to what they had served earlier. So, as his followers, we can trust his direction without hesitation. We can trust that God has the best in store for us, and we can know that at the end of the days, we will be unified with him, and that is because God saves the best for last. Please bow, bow your heads in prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for all that you've done for us, and we thank you for all of your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus. Thank you for your instruction, and thank you for always being there with us. I pray, Father, that as we go through this week, we will go out there and we will serve you. I pray that we will go and we will show your love to everyone we come in contact with, and we will bring the people to you, Father, and bring you to the people. You alone are worthy. You alone are holy. And I pray, Father, that we spend our days praising and worshiping you. We love you, and we pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So we come now to our time of invitation. You are formally invited to become a member of First Baptist St. Paul. You can rededicate your life to Christ, or you can make your first ever statement of faith and seek to become his follower. You are invited. Now please join us as we sing and stand, Take My Life, Lead Me, Lord. Oh, there's an extra comma, but... Take my life, lead me, Lord. 
thanks everybody for being here again this morning. Thank you for giving your attention and thank you for just joining us in this online worship environment. And if you have anything during the week you'd like to talk about, please feel free to email me, give me a call. Love to hear from you. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you this day and every day, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, my brothers and sisters. I love y'all. Until next week.